Zambia is on, Congo is on, um, uh, the rest of the team, Zimbabwe, uh, Malawi, of course, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, and the rest of us. You're welcome. Uh, this call today is, uh, is quite uh, an interesting one. It's going to be, uh, to, be, to be manned by Dr. Miriam Rapkin, uh, the Director of Health System Strategies uh, at Columbia, at ICAP Columbia, and the Associate Professor of Medicine and Epidemiology at, the, at Columbia University uh, within the May, uh, Mayland, Mayman uh, Public Health School. We have the pleasure to have her as our subject matter expert on this, uh, on this ECHO session. And she will be taking us on from here. She will be the one presenting the different uh, uh, case presentation teams that are already online. So I take the pleasure to welcome Dr. Miriam to take the session on. Dr. Miriam, you're welcome. Many thanks, and thanks to everybody joining us from around the world. As, as Charles uh, said, there are uh, multiple hubs working today, so we're, we're coordinating from um, uh, four or five different countries and joined by people from many more, so it's, it's lovely to see everybody. Um, as you know, today's webinar is going to focus on the issue of viral load utilization. Next slide, please. I'm going to make very brief framing remarks, and then we're going to be, we're sort of privileged to be joined by a team from Kenya who is going to present a case study and a team from Malawi. We've given them very strict instructions that they're only allowed to talk for 10 minutes, so they've been very good and narrowed down their presentations. But the purpose for that is that we really want to have questions and answers. So as before, as with the, the, the previous monthly um, calls, you can type your um, questions into the chat box or at the end, um, when we're, during the Q&A period, you can raise your hand and ask questions on camera. But we are gonna hold questions till the end. So you can either type them as we go or jot them down and ask them after the, the second case study. Next slide, please. So as you know, this um, great LabCop um, uh, teleconference series, ECHO series, has really been focusing at different points along the health system strengthening cascade with an eye to supporting the viral load cascade. And so um, we've sort of drawn that out here, the sort of elements along the cascade. And the next slide shows where we've focused, where these ECHO teleconferences have focused in the past. Next slide. Um, so, as you know, there have been um, great conversations around the issues of specimen transport and lab optimization. And next slide, this, today's um, uh, presentation is really going to focus on the, what we've drawn out here is the right side of the cascade. So, the issue around viral load utilization, the nuts and bolts of once the results have gotten back to the clinic, how do we use them to actually improve patient management? Next slide. So I think given sort of all the people who are on this call, I think that we are, we're probably all on the same page about what we mean about viral load utilization, what sort of the definition. But clearly I think that these different steps can seem very simple when you show them on a cascade like this, that we want the, the, not only the test to be done and the results to be returned to the clinic, but we want the results to be returned to the managing clinician, the nurse doctor or other, med or other clinician, we, the results also need to be shared with the patient and then used when they're high to provide usually in what uh, different countries call enhanced adherence counseling or intensified adherence counseling, repeat viral load testing, and then um, depending on the results of the repeat viral load, appropriate management. Or if the results are suppressed um, in many countries now, that is an entry point into uh, differentiated service delivery models. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today is that connection between the, getting the result and using the result. Next slide. This is just using illustrative data, but it shows, the, it sort of zooms in on what we're calling the viral load utilization cascade. And sadly, we know that at every step along this cascade, there, there are leaks. We're, we're losing people. So in theory, for people who have an un, what we'll call an unsuppressed viral load, 
um, and, and that'll be, we'll use the definition of more than a thousand copies per mil. Um, in theory, <laughs> depending on the, the country guidelines vary a little bit, but in theory, um, those patients should all get, in most countries, three enhanced or intensified adherence counseling sessions, a repeat viral load, and then if they have persistent unsuppressed viral load, they should have their ART regimen switched. And we know that, um, sadly, that that doesn't happen, and at each point along this cascade, we're losing the opportunities. Next slide. It seems simple, <laughs> but what, what needs to happen is we need to get the test results, the clinician, and the patient in the room all at the same time, um, and then take action on the results. And the reality of implementation is that that can seem very simple and actually can be quite difficult to achieve consistently. Next slide. So why are we focusing on viral load utilization? This is a topic that had been prioritized by, uh, in some of the, the needs assessments done for this, um, for LabCop, it's something that comes up a lot. Um, why do we think there's a problem? And there's a few reasons. One is historically, this has been a problem with other lab tests. So we know that approximately 50% of CD4 tests and early infant diagnosis tests performed in Sub-Saharan Africa were never used to guide treatment. Um, and early data suggests that we have some sort of early warning signs that that is the same with viral load, that we're spending tens or more, tens of millions of dollars uh, scaling up access to viral load and coverage of viral load, but that the results are not at uh, the moment necessarily being used consistently and effectively. So for example, in a national review from Kenya, only 4% of patients who had an unsuppressed viral load had a repeat viral load test, which suggests, again, that people are being lost from that cascade. Um, and similarly, there was a retrospective study in Mozambique that did a little bit better, but, but not great. And we'll hear from both presenters today, both teams of presenters today, that this is a challenge. Next slide. This is a slide that Lara Vajnov shared last year at the ASLM meeting which again shows that in the blue here, this is the number, this is a multi-country data set, the number of um, viral load tests that, uh, of individuals who had a viral load that was unsuppressed, and then the much, much smaller number of people who had a second viral load test. Next slide. So what's the problem? It seems pretty simple, but actually when we're talking about sort of busy clinics and the reality of implementation, we have challenges identifying um, patients who have unsuppressed viral load, acting on the results, and supporting patient engagement. And our presenters will tell us more about that. Next step. Next slide. What do we know works? There, there's early data, there's um, some studies, there's some QI projects, we'll hear more about that today. Um, there's, there's sort of examples and best practices. And some of the things that have been highlighted are the use of viral load focal persons or champions, the use of uh, having uh, standard operating protocols for patients with unsuppressed viral load, uh, rapid review of viral load results, not just letting the stack of papers uh, sit in the corner, either literally or metaphorically, the systematic use of unsuppressed viral load registers, and then just simple things like putting color-coded stickers or, or um, files on charts of patients who have unsuppressed viral load. Next slide. There are, um, so there are uh, resources that people have shared in other contexts, and we'd love to hear from you um, in the Q&A session about um, what resources you use. But so there are resources for enhanced adherence counseling. Next slide. There are um, the International Treatment Preparedness uh, Coalition has created um, an ITCP toolkit, an activist toolkit for um, campaigning for routine viral load monitoring to support um, demand creation. Next slide. And we've already started. This, this group has already started chatting. Um, so on the, the LabCop um, WhatsApp channel, there's already an ongoing vibrant discussion about what works and sharing ideas. And we sort of encourage you to, uh, you know, even after this, this particular um, session to continue connecting with one another through those channels. Next slide. One of the things that works, that seems to work, is um, rather than a specific intervention, is the use of quality improvement um, to address the gap between what we know we should do um, and what we actually do. And as a way to enable um, 
the generation of contextually specific, locally appropriate solutions. And so we'll hear today two case studies. Next slide. Um, from one from Kenya. So we're going. Um, the, our Kenyan presenter is going to be um, Caroline Karen Ayeko, who is a nurse with 12 years experience and currently the coordinator of H HIV and STI activities for the Siaya County Health Management Team in Western Kenya. So she'll lead the presentation of um, the, the Kenya case study, and she's backed up by, by multiple colleagues, so they'll all, all participate in the Q&A session. And then from Malawi, we're going to have um, Michael Odo, who is the technical advisor for HIV care and treatment for the Department of HIV AIDS at the Ministry of Health, and his colleague, Alimbekani Kanyenda, who's the country director for URC in Malawi. And they're also going to present a case study that focuses on the use of quality improvement. So with no further ado, I'm going to uh, hand over to Caroline to present on behalf of the Kenya team. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome, good afternoon, Kenyan time. My name is Caroline Karen Ayeko from Sierra County. Uh, we're going to present on uh, improving HIV viral load utilization in Sierra County, a quality improvement collaborative. And among the team, we have Redemptor, Dr. Maureen, and Dunstan Achoka from CDC. Next slide. Next slide. So this is the outline of the presentation. We're looking at the background and rationale, description of the QI collaborative and uh, early outcomes. Next slide. So in the background, we are saying Kenya has an estimated 1.5 million people living with HIV, with highest prevalence uh, in, in Western Kenya, CI included. Routine viral load testing has been scaled up uh, nationwide. MOH NASCOP guidelines recommended the following for clients with unsuppressed VL, one, three enhanced adherence counseling sessions at one month interval, Two, repeat viral load testing at three months. Then thirdly, if repeat viral load remains unsuppressed, then we change to new ART regimen. However, a review at the 30 facilities in Sierra County in 2016-2017 suggested that these guidelines were rarely followed and that utilization of VL results was suboptimal. Next slide. Uh, description of the QI collaborative. Next slide. So using the QA methodology to improve viral load out, uh, utilization, the selection of the improvement aim, then uh, 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 a group of, of experts uh, convened together to identify the best practices, develop an aim statement, indicators, and data SOPs. Then the facilities, the sites were defined, came up with a change. ideas and through the PDSS cycle that is act, plan, do, meant. This was followed by learning session two again we have plan again for the change ideas using the PDSS cycle. Uh, we've also had learning session three again where the facilities met to review the performance, discuss uh, ideas, uh, again plan uh, using the PDSS cycle. So far we've done four learning sessions and we anticipate to have the fifth learning session by the end of July, and after which we'll do the harvest of successful interventions, tools, and resources, and we expect to scale up and spread in Sierra County. Next slide. So those are the 30 high volume sites in Kenya that are supported by PEFA, uh, as you can see on the map. Next slide. QI collaborative activities. One, we had the intensive stakeholder engagement where we had the CHMT, the county health management team, the partners coming together to discuss on how to implement this uh, QI. Then secondly, we had the baseline training and project design where ICAP, MOH, NASCOP 
provided baseline training to QI teams at each site, including various uh, cadres, the nurses, physicians, lab technologies, peer educators, counselors. Then the QI teams conducted root analysis courses. This was basically to identify and prioritize the change ideas to improve viral load utilization in the county and conducted rapid tests of change ideas using the PDSS cycles to identify contextually appropriate interventions. Next slide. Monthly support supervisions, this one is done monthly in conjunction with the ICAP, the county health management team, the sub-county management team, other implementing partners offering HIV services in the county. We also have the quarterly uh, QIC learning sessions convening all the 30 sites together where diffusion of innovation and friendly competition is done and a careful documentation of interventions and outcomes are discussed. Next slide. Early outcomes, here we, look, we, we basically identify the common challenges and the root causes, the successful change ideas and the performance over time. Next slide. So after a thorough uh, root cause analysis, some of the challenges were identified and the challenges uh, were put under various categories. Category number one was under system challenges where we are looking at poor documentation and tracking of the VL results. There was delayed defaulter tracing of the clients, poor patient flow within uh, facilities. Then under staffing challenges, we, have, we had issues of staff shortages and remuneration challenges for case managers. Some staffs were unfamiliar with management of patients with unsuppressed VL. Then patient level challenges, patient uh, knowledge gap, meaning and importance of VL suppression. Concerns, there were fears, some didn't want to, to go to second uh, line ART. And challenges with adherence and retention. Next slide. So uh, illustrative change ideas. Uh, after the, conducting the 376 PDSA cycles, 35 change ideas were done in, uh, between uh, April 2017 and March 2018. Some of them are one, developing a high VL management SOP for the clients, color coding files for clients with unsuppressed VL for easy identification of the files, appoint a VL focal person to monitor the VL results so that they are filed up and early follow up of the clients for early interventions, assign case managers to clients with unsuppressed VL, update patient locator information at every visit. Some patients change their location and they would move to various locations and then form and suppress VL support groups for various groups, the adults, the adolescents, the children, and even the psychosocial support groups. Next slide. Uh, those uh, appoint a second line ART champion to improve client knowledge uh, and, 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 and myths and misconceptions. Then use the unsuppressed VL register weekly to identify and trace clients who miss appointments. Mentor all staffs on uh, enhanced adherence, counseling, and management of clients with unsuppressed viral load. Then finally, restructuring patient flow to improve real time documentation on the files just to ensure the, the, the ESCs are done timely. Next slide. So basically this is a graph showing the trend uh, of uh, the first aim, which uh, we are aiming to increase the percentage of clients with unsuppressed viral load who complete three ESCs within four months. to 90%. Uh, looking at the graph between the month of January, the first session was done in March. Then we started implementation in April. So look, looking at the graph, of course, in the first, next slide. Timely completion of ESCs and repeat viral load testing. This one basically we are around at 80%. Uh, uh, and we, we hope by the end of, uh, before we go for the learning session five, we'll have hit our target of 90%. Again, between January to March, it was pre implementation first. And then we started implementation from April 2017 to that. And as you can see the graph, there has been tremendous improvement with time. Next slide. Progress to aim to timely switch to second line. Uh, the aim here was to increase the proportion of clients with persistently and suppressed VL uh, to second line within four months to 90%. 
Again, this one we are doing well and we are about 87%. Uh, looking at the graph, there has been some up and down, but by the end of the, the implementation phase, we'll have hit our target of 90%. Next slide. Conclusions. QIC is still underway, but results today suggest that the use of QI methodology enabled individual health facility teams to identify contextually appropriate interventions so that we do timely interventions and timely solve client case management and has potentially contributed to achievement of the third 90 in county. At the conclusion of the QIC, the harvest result scalar plan will be Thank you very much. Uh, that was for Kenyan case study. Thank you very much. That was perfectly timed. You didn't go over at all. We really appreciate it. Um, so people, we're going to hold questions to the end. So I'm just, I'm very pleased with that presentation, both because it was it was rich um, and fast. So, so um, Mike is going to re is is going to reload the slides because uh, and switch to the Malawi presentation. Um, and then we'll we'll get started there. So Mike, can you switch us back to the slides? Excellent. Okay. So now we're going to turn over to our team from Malawi and hear about how they tackled a similar challenge using similar methodology and see sort of what, um, what, what the solutions and, and interventions that they identified. Um, we're gonna keep them also to 10 minutes and then we'll have lots of time for Q&A and for other people to share their experiences as well. We need to end the micro. So next slide, please. Okay, so the main objective of this project is to improve quality uh, uh, systems in selected health facilities in the four districts, and it's been funded by Bill and Melinda Gates. And as I've said, we are in four districts, in Chinji, Karonga, Deza, and Balaka. Actually, the we main, main objective is to improve access to quality laboratory services, improve use of laboratory data, including valid results, and provide technical support to improve patient-centered care. And also we intend to also look into the uh, laboratory infrastructure improvement. Next slide. So when we look at the viral load cascade, you will see that uh, uh, 3,278 were eligible for viral load uh, in these facilities, but out of that only 44% uh, had at least one viral load. And if um, only 50% uh, were compliant to, to IAG. The next slide, please. On the cascade analysis, I think facilities uh, are not are actively tracking client data through viral cascade. And then you while well, 78% of high value clients uh, were enrolled, only 50% completed IAC. And surprisingly, a large percentage of IRT clients, which 47% are receiving a drug prescription, despite not being eligible, uh, not no viral result in a client card. National IAC guidelines do not exist, which hinder IAC implementation. So Michael is going to take over the next slide. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Limby. Um, I, I think uh, the uh, thanks to Limby for giving us that good picture from four districts, and they actually reflect the national situation. Um, and I think it's not very bizarre and particular about uh, Malawi. Um, we are seeing the same thing coming from Kenya. Is the huge momentum um, building up from? Uh, the struggle to get to the first 90, and then the second 90 with a lot of efforts uh, in various 
uh, clinic environment, a lot of uh, partners working actively to improve HIV testing and also doing a lot of work to connect to um, treatment. So that, that momentum has had a lot of advantage. And I think what we are beginning to see in the top 90 um, is, the, is the disadvantage kind of that has come out of that. And so we find a lot of people who are eligible for viral load and then either samples are not taken as and when due. We are lucky to have a very good guideline. Our guideline is a bit less than the WHO recommendation. We propose to do a two yearly viral load, not annually, and that is directly link, linked to cost efficiency. Um, um, so in these four districts where we have just presented, you see less than 50% of those eligible for viral load having their viral load, viral, um, load done, and then about 50% having completion of intensive adherence counseling to the point of where regimen is changed. Move to the next slide, please. So in the next slide, I'll just talk briefly on the engagement of URC with the Ministry of Health. And the uniqueness of the strategy that was brought is particularly in bringing government leadership to the process. Uh, not just bringing government leadership to the process, but helping to cascade that intervention to the district level and to the site level. Because in a way, when you run through the PDSA cycle, during the engagement process, one of the key um, challenges, high clinic load is one, but the health facility staff attitude is also something that is quite problematic. So putting them in leadership, align them at opportunity to generate answers to the problems around them is quite sustainable. And this is one of the approach that was used uh, running through a viral load cascade cohort analysis with them, running through the entire uh, change ideas with the PDSA cycle with them on the leadership was something that we considered extremely helpful as it is um, shown. Next slide. I like Limby to just take on this. So currently, uh, I just go through the chai, uh, uh, projects uh, which we, we are engaged in. So we've, we've seen improved percentages of eligible clients receiving valid tests. They have also noted the increased number of clients notified of valid results, which was not the case before. And there's also documentation uh, processes being improved, both for Valid results in the valid register. So we have uh, high valid registers which have been introduced by the Department of HIV in the facilities. And overall, we have also seen an increase in uh, patients on AIAC. Next slide, please. Uh, and when we talk about changes of ideas being employed, uh, we have uh, uh, increased the number of audits. So we have regular audits for patient cards and registers uh, on valid registers. And uh, we also have intensified mentorship so that we, we support the uh, healthcare workers to follow through this uh, result documentation and notification to the patient and uh, assigning specific responsibility to staff for patient notification and follow-up. Uh, we also now use a, a color code just to highlight that this uh, result coming from the lab is having high value alert, and um, so that we can track uh, that patient uh, to come for IAC. And we have really enforced uh, on the monthly ART supply for all clients unless uh, identified. And we have also intensified the uh, frequency of the quality improvement meetings in the health facilities where this project is being uh, implemented. Next slide, please. Uh, Michael, can take over. Okay, so thanks a lot again to um, Limbi and team for those initiatives in those four projects. Um, but the, the early reviews have shown clear improvements, as we can see on the slide, starting from documentation, as he rightly mentioned, uh, with the leadership of the Minister of Health, the high, the viral load registers and the high viral load registers uh, were produced and deployed to these sites. So it was a huge problem initially that documentations were not happening. 
So the first step is seeing uh, documentation moving above the average. Next slide. Um, closely linked to that is the increase in percentage of clients with high viral load uh, moving from 20% to 90%. So it kind of like became our scorecard telling us, showing us the problem that was there and that we, we probably never saw before. Next slide. And then of course, uh, it, it, it generated a lot of interest among the health workers um, because it's like uncovering the problem that was there. So the viral load sample collection also jacked up from 60% to 99%. Next slide. So in conclusion, uh, Limbi will wrap up. So in conclusion, we have to continue with the QI activity that is facilitated, engaging all the teams involved in this project and uh, identifying additional uh, pro projects. And again, we have to prioritize on uh, implementation strategy. We also intend to embark on uh, QI collaboratives in each district through district QI teams. Uh, aligning objectives, indicators, and change of ideas, further uh, testing and uh, the dissemination of this information. And then continue to collaborate with the Minister of Health uh, and uh, the Department of HIV staff uh, to develop and implement a national guidelines. I think this is what Michael was just talking earlier on, that now these uh, guidelines are in place. And then we expect that uh, with all these strategies put in place and adhered to, we anticipate to see a great improvement in this uh, regard in the coming few months. And then after that, we will scale up the best practices which will come out of this project to other districts uh, above, uh, uh, in addition to the four uh, current pilot districts. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Thank you very much. Another perfectly timed um, presentation. That's terrific. Thank you to both teams. We're already getting some questions in the chat box. So I'm going to read the first one. Um, so I'm keeping an eye on the chat box. Our headquarters team in uh, Addis is actually keeping an eye on your faces. So if you are waving your hand and no one is unmuting you, just also tell us in the chat box because we now have about a half an hour for discussion and conversation. So um, I am going to, the, I'm going <laughs> so one of the first questions is for me, um, which is asking why when, we, when I, we talked about viral load utilization, why did, did my slide zoom in on the issue of utilization of unsuppressed results? So that's a fantastic question. It gives me the opportunity to preach uh, to the choir about the use of suppressed viral load results because we wanted to, uh, obviously when we say utilization, there's one cascade for people who are unsuppressed. So we want to provide them counseling, repeat testing, and then use the results. But there's another cascade for people who are suppressed, which is that we want to use those results um, to at least offer them the opportunity to enroll in um, in many countries to enroll in differentiated service delivery models. So in a way, that's the, the entry point. A suppressed viral load is the entry point um, to um, the, the sort of DSD. Um, so that's something we talk about a lot in our sequin learning network. I focus on this just because both of our case studies were, were more focused on the, um, the unsuppressed viral load results. But remember, one of the introductory slides, we did say that there's, there's two cascades. So it's a great question, and thank you. Um, there is a, um, a question from, uh, two questions from Dahlia to uh, the Kenya team. Um, so uh, she said, I had a, a question from Caroline's presentation. I found it very interesting that there were two slides worth of changes made. And actually, they said that there were 35 changes. They only, they only zoomed in on a few of them. But the question is, were there some that were the most helpful? Were there game changers? Or was it sort of a little bit, every change made a little uh, impact? So what were the most helpful change ideas? And then specifically, you mentioned the second line champions to help improve the client knowledge. Were those champions, were those peer educators, or were they trained clinic health providers? So we'll ask um, Redempta to unmute, Redempta and Caroline to unmute, and hand 
hand the mic over to them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. I'm responding to the first question on the change ideas. I'm Redemptor, the QA coordinator. I work with And the number of change ideas we did, we did were many. We have been trying to do several PDSSI calls from March last year up to today. And we have several change ideas that we can say the change ideas that have worked magic. And maybe during the harvest and dissemination, we'll be able to share the best practice change ideas. These are just an illustration of that, some of the change ideas. So we could not put all that information in the presentation. Two, we concentrated on the unsuppressed viral load, not only the unsuppressed viral load, but we looked at the cascade of viral load result utilization from the time the results come back to the facility to the time the intervention is done. And so we're also looking at the resuppression rates and the switching for those who did not suppress after interventions, meaning those patients have a true treatment failure. So we're looking at the viral load cascade, and this was informed by the baseline data that we collected that shows in Kenya, there was a lot of uh, viral load testing that was done, but the results were not utilized back in the facility. They were taking one year and a half, two years, so long for patients to be done intervention. That is what gave back to this project. The question is, was the peer educators. Yes. Yeah. The second line champions, these were patients who have undergone through ESC sessions and they have completed sessions and they have been switched to second line. They have undergone uh, literacy classes about, uh, you know, separation, about ART, relationship between ARTs and the HIV, the OIs that come in future treatment options, all those topics were able to check the patient's school. And so this patient would inform, you know, be used as a champion to help the other patients who are refusing and declining to be switched to second line, to see the need in focus group discussion and be able to see they are not only the ones who are being switched to second line, but there is hope even after you've been, you have failed first line. And it really worked peer-to-peer, -peer, it has really worked in Sierra County. So that was a great answer. I'm going to put you on the spot, though, because Dahlia said, was there a game changer? And you said, well, there's a lot, and we're going to talk about it. But so we know that you don't have the final data, and it's not formal, and we're not going to quote you. But, but just from your experience working with the teams, were there – so. Um, one of the things that I heard from, from both presentations was the use of, of um, an unsuppressed viral load register. Um, yes. But is, were there, if you had to pick just a few things you're talking to your colleagues and saying, if you're not trying this, you should try it, what would that short list be? Three things. Three things okay. that I should do. What I can't hear. Oh, game changers. Oh, oh, the okay. three things that were game. Yes. Peer to peer. Peer to peer. Okay. Is one of the, the the game changer that has worked, especially among the adolescents and then the the caregivers for these children who have high VL and suppressed by a lot, and the the patient education. It has really helped the patient okay. to understand the viral load, and then. Use of uh, the VL focal persons to be able to track down and follow up to make sure, you know, and the case managers to follow up and make sure these patients have received interventions. And 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 lastly, I would say facility staff needs a lot of mentorship on guidelines. us to have the knowledge of us. Yes. Okay. So, so great. Thank you. And thank you for letting me kind of put you on the spot there. So um, you highlighted some issues that had to do with demand. So, or with, with patient education and empowerment and reassurance, and then some yes. issues that had to do with supply, um, which were the idea of having really just having people who's like their charge, this is their responsibility. So 
case managers or focal persons to really like they, they come to work in the morning thinking about viral load utilization. Um, yes. So before we get to the other questions, I'm actually going to extend that question to the Malawi team. So um, when you're thinking about, again, you, you tested a lot of different changes, um, but are there ones that stood out to you as game changers? Um, Michael, you're still on mute. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So I think one of the game changers is uh, we discovered that when the results uh, come from the molecular labs to the requesting facilities, there was no proper tracking of who is to receive the results and who is to notify the clinician and how to, uh, to trace the, uh, to, to reach out to the patient. And as such, we developed an SOP of how to handle the results at the HEPA facility. Secondly, results come in a batch. And by just looking at the batch, one could not tell which one is not suppressing and which one is suppressing. Hence, we developed the register and the uh, red sticker issue so that mm -hmm. any uh, HEPA facility personnel receiving the results, by just looking at the batch, he will know that these are and suppressing and they need immediate attention so that they are called back to the clinic. So those are the two main uh, game changers which I can recall. And maybe the third one would be we did sensitize the uh, uh, staff in the RRT clinic on uh, what to do if they see uh, that the, among the batch of results which have been received, there are some which, who are not uh, suppressing. So it's to put it to uh, into screening the mechanism of trying to reach out to those uh, patients' consent so that they are attended to by the clinician. And at the same time, the clinician is prompted that we have so many who are not suppressing which need your attention. And again, to also make sure that even those who are suppressing, they're still notified to come to the clinic that, so that they have their results for uh, patient management. Michael? Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Limby. I think to add a few more words to Limby's explanation, um, putting the facility leadership uh, on top of the change ideas was a, a very critical step. Uh, because like, it's not that these problems are not as known, but I think putting people who are sitting there on a daily basis in leadership and doing a bit of hand-holding through the process to help them identify the problem and then seeing the relevance of the solution that are being projected uh, is pretty helpful. And I think um, helping clients to understand the value of suppressed results, I mean, uh, until the high viral load register, which I hear from the Kenyan team, is called the unsuppressed um, viral load register. So we call it high viral register here. I think de delineating a particular register which becomes like um, um, a document that, that keeps all the problem cases, so to speak, helps the clinician to clearly know what volume of patients are not suppressing and therefore what, vol what number of attention that needs to happen and how quickly. Uh, secondly, Helping patients to own their health it was a very critical step um, because the number of patients that started putting a demand for their viral load happened because the relevance of a high viral load and, and a suppressed viral load versus a high viral load became very um, useful in the sensitization process that happened in the intensive adherence counseling session. And, and that itself had a cascade uh, a knock-on effect in the patients telling their, their other peers about the value of taking your viral load sample. And I think this is the entire messaging we want to carry nationwide. Uh, patients need to be educated to understand the value of viral load results, whether it is suppressed and whether it's not suppressed. And, and that messaging has a huge knock-on effect in placing a demand. Because if patients were to be asking for a viral load result, the clinic situation notwithstanding, granted that we have a high 
um, volume clinic with a lot of congestion. But when a patient understands the value of demanding for their result, then the, the problem we had before with results coming to the clinic and being stuck somewhere and action not being taken, there will be a kind of push effect. And this is one of the things that the, the project helped us to achieve. So thank you. I, I think one of the, the sort of themes that we're hearing is, although we like a magic bullet, um, there, and there are certainly, it sounds like there are ideas that are, that are bubbling to the top as most effective, this is very much a systems challenge. So you'll hear that the Kenya team tested 35 ideas. Only one of those had anything to do with training the clinicians. Um, they're much more the sort of bread and butter of quality improvement, which is thinking, how do, we, how do we notice that we need to do something? How do we check to see if it's done? How do we you know, work both of the, the push and the pull? Um, and so I think that the, the common denominator here of quality improvement is, is probably something that, that itself may be sort of the, the game changer. Um, Dr. Nicholas had raised his hand. So um, if you could, uh, if, if Team Addis could unmute Dr. Nicholas, he could ask a question. Yeah, th uh, thank you very much, Dr. Miriam. Yeah, thanks to the Malawi team and uh, Kenyan team for the wonderful presentations made. I have a question for the Malawi team. I understand that our Vialod is supposed to see the response of the client to art, and uh, that's why actually the recommendation of doing it after six months when a patient has been on art was made. And uh, in your preamble, in your presentation, you said that you do monitoring every two years. So my question is, uh, of course, you gave the reason of cost effectiveness as one of the reasons as to why you do the monitoring every two years. Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, don't you think when you take a lot of time, like two years to monitor these clients, you are bound to have uh, drug resistance cases growing more and more? And don't you think that this is going to be a big problem? You have so many unsuppressed patients in the future. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. That, that's, that's a very good question. And, and, and I said before, in Malawi, we do guideline that we expect facilities to follow. We expect the district leadership to also follow. And the guidelines are matched with available resources. For the last couple of years, the resources we use directly for global fund, bulk of the resources comes from global fund. And so um, we, we match the prescription in the guideline with the available resources. So people know clearly that whatever request they are making, the resources <laughs> available there uh, tied to the number of viral load platforms, tied to availability of sample collection, transport process, processes. So that worked very well for uh, a six monthly viral load for treatment naive patients that are initiated, and then two, two yearly after that. Um, we reflected and wanted to make a change to an annual viral load in our 2018 treatment guideline. Now that gave us a huge gap of about 32 million USD. We don't have that resources on the table. Now, like Lindy presented, if you looked at the introductory background, we're having about 40, 50% of viral load resource that we're not in, in themselves utilized. So we have a good laboratory platform. We have a good sample transport uh, process, but in terms of using the result, we are we 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 far from expectation. And if you look at our entire cohort, only about 10% of our population are on second line. We have about 740,000 patients uh, alive on treatment. And just about 10% of that are on second line. When you do a system um, analysis, the problems are coming into these results not being used. And of course, you have huge number of um, patients who are out there who are due for viral load and never demanded for it because their first intention is to just pick up their medication and walk out of the clinic. So this is where the QI intervention um, held by a couple of uh, supports is getting, and, and they are far supported um, 
projects that are also doing the same thing. And we are gathering all of these evidences. But ultimately, to have something that will give a national coverage, the lessons from projects must be scaled up very, very quickly. And that's why we have only, uh, in the last uh, two months, established a 10-man mentorship team per district. And because we realize that most of these issues are heavily systemic, there are some that, can, that, that are, you can address with the available resources. There are some that require some uh, inflow of resources <coughs> to make the changes sustainable. Great. So th this topic of sort of the uh, national guidelines about the frequency of viral load, I think is really, it's, it's getting a lot, of, a lot of questions and a lot of interest. It may, it may be a topic for another webinar or another discussion. What I'd like to do is in our last 10 minutes, come back to a few of the questions that are in um, the chat box. Um, but the, uh, also, if you have experiences that you want to share, if, if you want to have another um, a teleconference that's focused on this issue of viral load utilization, um, send us ideas, put them in the chat box, email them to us, um, put them on our uh, uh, on the, uh, LabCop um, Slack channel or um, WhatsApp group. Um, I'm going to go back to Violet, who has a follow-up question for the Kenya team. Um, so it's so so uh, it's a follow-up question to the idea of patient education as a game changer. So for Caroline and Redempta, how is this done differently from the normal adherence sessions in health education? So it sounded to me, Caroline and Redempta, correct me if I'm wrong, as though you created a new type of patient education for patients with unsuppressed viral load using peer educators who had themselves been switched to second line ART regimens. But I may have not understood that correctly. So um, can we, um, okay, so you're unmuted. So we're gonna ask you to answer Violet's question. Yes, in Kenya, we know patient education is still part of the, the, the health, uh, you know, part of the package that is given to our patients who are on care. However, in this case, we looked at the BL, so it's a new thing in the country, and many patients were not aware about BL. Many patients were aware about the CD4 and they had enough information about it. So we realized the kind of health talks and information given to patients is general. Focused on the VL clinic days, we have viremic clinic days where we have specific topics where we focus on the patient understanding what VL is all about, what is the importance of being suppressed, why should we have the family suppressed, and what will happen if you don't suppress your virus and the issues of future option drugs if you don't suppress your virus or you develop mutating pattern. Yeah, I think that is where we focus. Excellent. So there's another question from Charles. It's actually come from both Pascal and Charles in different forms. So I'm going to ask it of both groups. Um, so basically the question is, how do you take this ideas that you've generated from your, um, your, your projects and take them to scale at a national level? And then, then I'm going to add a little follow-up question, which is, would you scale the ideas or would you suggest scaling the process, which is QI? So do you think that there are some ideas that are just so good that they should just be handed over to other health facilities nationwide? Um, and or do you think that the process of QI, of having sites monitor their performance and come up with their own ideas is also important to scale? So um, I'm gonna ask the Kenya team to answer that first since they're already unmuted and then the Malawi team to chime in. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, regarding the question one, we, we need to scale up the ideas that is important to, from one facility to another one. Uh, looking at the QI project actually from, from the, the few years or the few months we, we, we put the intervention in place, this has really enabled us to achieve our third 90. Basically, the, even the 30 facilities that were, had the QI methodology being implemented, as we looked in the graphs, they were doing so well and we are heading to achievement of the third 90. So we really want to scale the ideas to other facilities. And for system improvement, then we'd also need to scale up uh, the change ideas even at the management level. 
both at the sub-counties and even at the county level to address the system challenge issues. And before the Malawi team answers, I'm going to ask a follow-up question just because I'm a little familiar with the Kenya case study. I think that you put a lot of effort into, I think both teams, put a lot of effort into stakeholder engagement before the projects took place. So this isn't like one implementing partner yes. doing a little project off in the corner by themselves. It's really hand-in-hand, ministry-led, but also with a lot of local stakeholders. And I think you're also going to have a dissemination plan, right, to scale up nationally with the support of NASCOP. Am I remembering correctly? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, okay, so we'll hand over to Malawi. Sorry, the Kenya team froze for a moment. So we'll hand over to Malawi. And again, the questions are, how would you take this, how would you take the, the interventions to scale? And is it the change ideas or the QI process or both that you would want to take to scale? Yeah, I think uh, it's good to scale up the ideas, but ideas can be uh, shared, but implementation is another thing. So that's where we need to scale both the ideas and share the ideas uh, to all the district, uh, districts and also uh, 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 scale up the uh, 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 quality improvement uh, uh, projects uh, in the districts because this is what is going to bring the impact actually on the ground. As I said that sharing ideas is another thing but implementing, putting them into action is another. Uh, you also mentioned about uh, 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 collaboration. Yes, even in Malawi, we started the project. We wanted to make it that the districts involved should own the project. Mm -hmm. That was done for the sake of UIT uh, at the end of uh, the pilot phase. So the district management teams, which we call them here, had to choose the sites based on the workload and uh, had to put in place quality improvement teams in the sites and even at the district hospital so that they own the system because it's a thing which is going to be there for even, uh, it's like an open source where they can even add, add on some programs which would also need the same approach. Great. So I, my, my backup team is pointing out to me that we're actually at the end of the hour. So this has been a really vibrant conversation. I would encourage you to let um, the LabCop core team know if you want to continue, if we want to do another um, webinar or, or echo session on this same topic of utilization, or if you have uh, case studies of your own to share experiences, because I know there's just a wealth of knowledge out there. I mean, the whole point is to continue to, to exchange. Um, but I think that um, Charles has just some closing announcements, unless Charles, you want me to make them. So either, either speak up or I will, <laughs> one way or another. So among so so okay. one of the Charles, are you are you unmuted? Oh, there you are. Yes. Okay, take over. Yes, I am. Okay. Yes, thanks, Dr. Miriam, and uh, all presenters. That has been very educative and uh, vibrant uh, uh, discussion that has followed. Just shows that uh, there was a lot of interest and it being shared. We will, uh, we will circulate the presentation on, uh, uh, to the members. Then uh, the recording, we shall put it on the YouTube, on the website, so you can have some follow-up. Uh, uh, you can turn to these materials for an in-depth look at uh, the information that has been shared. I know there are still lots of, I see these as QI interventions, still very limited in implementation. Uh, and yet we want really to scale up interventions that eventually will quickly help us uh, reach the, 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 the clients. So there could be some uh, best practices that you have out there that are already being implemented. The discussion will continue on WhatsApp. So we continue discussion. We will continue. Uh, please uh, throw out ideas that you have some of the interventions that have been game changers, they may not be QI interventions, but they are part of your routine work, but eventually have shown some positive impact. You can act costs, some of these uh, best that uh, eventually change the things around programs, patients, and getting them and implement 
and are utilizing the results to pay for. So the discussion should continue on Skype, you know, on WhatsApp. And then we also have the, uh, the Slack platform. Uh, those of us who can turn to so post this presentation in Slack, turn there and let uh, with the discussions. Uh, we will, um, we will, uh, we we're going to have uh, uh, an evening uh, uh, team meeting at the International AIDS Conference. Uh, the other going to be at, who are planning to be at the International AIDS Conference. Please indicate uh, by way of sending a mail uh, or on WhatsApp. Indicate to me whether you're going to be at the International AIDS uh, in, in July. Uh, so that in Amsterdam, so that we can uh, invite you to this session that we are going to have. We are also planning to have a meet, uh, to have a face-to-face -face meeting in December. Uh, in, in October, we will be giving you uh, a heads up on the details of the preparations. Uh, and then country, uh, first, I mean, country visits are also continuing. We are out to countries. We've I reached out to Kenya and Tanzania in the last weeks, and then we shall be reaching out countries, Zimbabwe, Malawi, and others. We are coming to have face-to-face -face discussion on how to change our practice. Otherwise, uh, thank you very much, and for all the different discussions that we have had, let us let the discussions continue on WhatsApp. So, if you have any your phone number. Please do, do so we can have you on WhatsApp. Have a good day, please. It's our session. Good day. Bye to all of us. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.